the first Goetheanum lives on imperishably in the spiritual world. Today there is no one left who saw this building on earth. But anyone who visits Dornach today can see a part that was not destroyed, the central statue this work of art actually belongs to the building that no longer stands on earth. It is now homeless. Yet in it, the spiritual presence of the first Goetheanum reaches into the physical world. You can regard the statue as a museum piece a last remnant of the first Goetheanum, to be preserved and exhibited. Or put it in its rightful central position, not only artistically, but above all spiritually, in the mystery center of the new mysteries, which are of a Christian direction. These should ray out like the ancient mystery temples, into all areas of human endeavor. Clearly it needs a pedestal, by the way, to find its height in the apse. The unfinished statue could have been exhibited at the opening of the Goetheanum in September of 1920, but wasn't. Rudolf Steiner said our age, including the members of the Anthroposophical Society, was not ready for it. But thereby, it was saved. When the curtain opens, you are met by a counter stream approaching from the future a presence at the far end of the axis of progressive symmetry striding toward you. The coming one. In the axis, from left to right, are the organ loft, the rostrum, and the statue, that is, the space to support the music, the sculptural larynx for the spoken word, and the logos as being. The Goetheanum is the house of the word. The statue is a collaboration between Rudolf Steiner and the sculptress Edith Marion. She traveled far to hear him speak for the first time. Even though she did not understand German, she immediately recognized he was her teacher. And in that lecture, he spoke at length about the need for a new artistic image of Christ. The sculpture is over 31 feet tall. It is carved in deep relief, except the central figure, which stands free. A member of the Anthroposophical Society donated several tons of elm wood from the Bernese Highlands for the statue. The elm leaf shows the mercurial dynamic harmony between the forces that pull downward and upward. Parts are unfinished. For instance, what must be intended as water and fire to complete the formations of the four elements in the four corners. Ariman hardens the world and man. 
Lucifer softens. We need both, but in the right places, at the right times, in the right ways. By themselves, Lucifer and Ariman are representatives of the warping of humanity, gushing mysticism and dry materialistic pedantry. Lucifer sucks the juice out of the lemon, as Rudolf Steiner puts it, namely human souls, to form a world of his own. Ariman squeezes it out to harden what remains behind. The fundamental elements of sculpture are the convex and the concave. Ariman is dug in. Lucifer bulges out. Only the representative of humanity is standing. Lucifer's legs are underdeveloped. He lifts away from the earth. He shows the hidden physiological unity of breathing, speaking, and hearing. His rib cage, larynx, ears, and shoulder blades all merge and bloat. He is enwrapped in himself. The human column rises straight. The vault of the head is gathered from all directions of the cosmos above. The Greek column shows a billowing capital. The Roman arch bears pressure gathered from all directions from above. The brow of Lucifer swells. That of Ariman is bashed in as if by a hatchet. The brow of the representative of humanity opens freely and rhythmically to the world. Ariman's grip pulls things right in front of his popping eyeballs into hyper focus. Lucifer gazes inward, his head inclined. These two cosmic forces work in our waking and sleeping. The representative of humanity gazes freely into the world, but with ineffable depth. Ariman clutches. Lucifer touches and then retreats like an N in Eurythmy. The hands of the representative of humanity turn to earth and heaven, uniting the two in a synthesis of the gestures of Plato and Aristotle. The hand is threefold, with the light of thinking in the index and middle fingers, the sensitivity of feeling in the two outer fingers, and the strength of will in the thumb. Human walking unites the above and the below the left and the right, the before and the behind, in rhythmically alternating asymmetry as a living staff of mercury. When we stride, 
we question our balance ever again. The rhythm of walking carries us. Lifting away from the earth alternates with holding fast. Rhythm heals polarity. The limbs work strongly. The head shines free and sovereign, calm and clear. The breast opens wide to other beings. The threefold countenance shows wonder in the forehead, compassion in the eyes, and conscience responsibility in the mouth and jaw below. Lucifer and Ariman lack wonder, compassion, and conscience. Instead, Lucifer, for all his tragic beauty, shows self-absorption and irresponsibility. Ariman, cynicism and automatism. The representative of humanity synthesizes all polarity in dynamic asymmetry. When the representative of humanity steps forward, chakras, organs of higher awareness, appear as vortex currents in the head and the great heart region. He opens a free space. Lucifer plummets. Ariman is fettered. At the abyss, freeness is possible. Freedom without love brings the fall into the abyss. The lowest third is largely cut off and less redeemed. Yet Ariman is put in his place there to support us. Now he imitates the gesture of the representative of humanity, striving upward toward him. Ariman's wings begin to unfold. Lucifer, who was disengaging from the earth, breaks his wings and inverts. He too imitates the gesture of the representative of humanity. With his left hand, here unfinished, he grows beyond himself and connects with the earth. And then there is a spectator. 